Welcome once again to another CAN TV virtual workshop. I'm your host, Eric Torres, an instructor here at CAN TV. So, thank you everyone for being here virtually. Um, today's topic is edit workflow. And so, I'm going to go into a lot of things that I would like to call intermediate level things. Uh, for beginners, it's possible that this could be a little daunting. Um, it's just detailed, that's all. It's just a lot of information. So hopefully this will be of use to all of you watching. Uh, we do encourage your responses, feedback. We don't get a lot of feedback from these workshops, so uh, we would love to hear from you. Either right now during the chat, you can leave messages, or you can you know, tell us later. You can email us later. That will help us improve our workshops and uh, make new ones. So if you have suggestions for new workshops, of course, we are open to hearing that. Um, now, I am not an expert editor, OK? <laughs> I've been editing a long time, many years, but I don't consider myself an expert. So um, I have to qualify this workshop first by saying that, because um, there is no one way to edit. And the ways that I'm going to discuss tonight, um, they're my ways. They're the ways that I've developed for my own self. A lot of editing does end up being self-taught. And um, so these are some, I'm going to share some of the things that I've learned over the years. And I continue to learn. Even today, I've learned a few new things, just getting ready for this workshop. So I like to do a, a learning experience that's mutual you know, Paolo Freire style. So that's what I encourage if anyone out there knows how to do something better than me uh, or any of us here, chime in. Go ahead. Share the wealth. Share your information. OK, so I have to start by um, taking you on a little walk. You know, um, I, I, before I get started, I think there's somebody you need to meet, somebody that I think you're going to find really interesting. So come down the hall with me. I'm going to. Um, Introduce you to somebody, and we'll see what he's up to. All right. Ah, looks like our intrepid editor, Eric Ramirez, at work there. Uh oh, he's in the middle of an edit, but I'm not sure it's going well. In fact, he's doing a lot of clicking, and he's beginning to sweat. Looks like some of his clips went offline. Uh oh, that's not good. I think things are beginning to go south for him. It doesn't look like he's very well organized, that's the thing. I mean, you know, he could definitely be better organized. You can see the, uh, the, the mess he's got going there. He's got quite, a, quite an array of things there, and I think he's just probably going to lose it any second now. Oh, there he goes. Yeah, so, you know, this is kind of a, a, moral, a moralistic tale here of uh, <laughs> what not to do. Uh, you don't want to be like that, that guy. I'm not saying Eric Ramirez in real life is anything like that. No, he's, he's, he's a good editor. But I'm just, um, you know, this is just what happens when you're not organized, um, when you haven't put thought into the way that you want to do your project. You know, that, that can happen. You know, you can reach a boiling point pretty easily. Things can get overwhelming. Um, the workshop tonight is dealing with more complex type of projects, actually. If it's a simple project, then you're not going to, probably not going to come to that point that you saw, um, you saw him coming to. So, you know, if you do have a complex project, though, uh, we do recommend that you get organized. And um, what does that mean? Well, I want to go back to my first item of the agenda. Why don't we take a look at the agenda here? So overall, uh, we want to talk about what is, what is a workflow, uh, generally and specifically. And generally, that basically means the way that you go about doing your, your, your whole process, you know, from beginning to ending. So your process, uh, we recommend that it begin with creating a plan and gathering your assets together. Uh, assets are your clips of video, your audio clips, graphics, photos, music, all those sorts of things. And then that you actually watch them and assess them. Um, because it's, it's possible that after you 
uh, recorded the, the, the material, you know, time, a lot of time tends to go by. Time can, it could be just weeks or months where you begin to forget what you have or, you, you, you know, it all becomes kind of mixed up. So you have to really watch it before you can effectively edit it. And so take the time to familiarize yourself with your own material. Um, you might assume that you already know it really well, but you'll be surprised if you go back and look at it, you'll see and hear certain things that are gonna influence your editing decisions. It might be sound, you know, maybe the sound, uh, you'll notice if you're paying attention, you'll notice maybe the sound has problems um, that you're gonna have to somehow mitigate in editing or work around. Same with your, with your video. Um, so yeah, you really should watch it. And another reason for watching it is because then um, you're gonna need to transfer it. You're gonna need to transfer that raw footage, those raw materials to a, a more workable place where it makes sense to use it. Um, you never wanna edit directly off of an original uh, medium such as your SD card. Um, so SD cards, as everybody hopefully knows, um, are these little cards, you know, these little, yeah, you should know this by now, uh, you know, that go into a camera and you shoot on these and the camera records it. You, you shoot on these, camera records it into the format that it is set up for. And so um, you never wanna edit directly to and from these uh, for one reason, the card is simply not designed for editing. It's not designed for the back and forth data uh, transfer throughput of the computer. You know, it's, it's designed to store, to archive. It's not designed to interact so back and forth in that manner. The other reason is because it's original material. You, you don't want to damage it. You don't want to risk losing it. Um, that could happen. You know, the computer might do something un, unsavory. You might lose it. So the idea here is that you transfer this material um, to a, a more sensible place, and that would be an external hard drive. And so I'll get into that, because there's a lot of, um, there's an art to that really kind of in a way. And <laughs> so we'll, we'll talk about that. We're also gonna talk about once you do transfer it, um, you, you wanna rename it, you wanna label it, you wanna, you know, baptize it, you wanna, <laughs> You wanna not leave it as just numbers, you know, just data numbers that the camera gives it because, you know, that's no fun. That's, there's, how can you, you know, work with that? It's like having children and the hospital just assigns them a number when they're born. No, you, you, you wanna give them a proper name. Um, same goes for folders and sometimes as otherwise known as bins. It depends on the editing program you're working with. The, the higher end programs call, tend to call them bins. Um, these are places where you organize your material. And so organization is the name of the game here. So that's the general workflow um, to get started. More specific workflow would be having a um, discussion about your hardware setup. Um, so what kind of computer, how powerful is it, how many processors, where do you store your material, things like that. Um, Software settings, so all editing programs have the ability to be set up a certain way. So some ways uh, are better for what you're trying to do than others. So going into the settings a bit. Um, and cut progression, cut progression that has to do with the, the overall general way that you work, which is you start out by once you've done all this prep work, once you've done the thinking, the planning, uh, then you're gonna start to actually edit. And so that starts in a very kind of rudimentary way. You start to take all your different materials and lay them out on a timeline in your editing program. You're not at this point worried too much about how they're flowing together. You're not worried exactly about how short or long it is. You're just trying to get them on a timeline in some kind of an order that makes some preliminary kind of sense. So. That's your assembly cut, your assembly edit. You're assembling, roughly assembling the project. Once you've done the assembly edit, then you can move on to the next stage, which is known as the rough cut. And so the rough cut, it's still gonna be rough at this point, but you're, you're getting it closer. The whole thing is like a long process. It's like a marathon. You're trying, you know, it has different parts of town that you're running through. So this part of town, it's called the, the rough cut. And this is where you do start to bring things down tighter, make them a little bit more concise. Um, this, 
does go back to your overall concept. Your overall concept is, you know, gonna, should include, you know, the format, which is how long do you want this piece to be? How long do you want it to be? Who is this for, et cetera? You know, those sorts of questions. So, so that's where you start to, the rough cut starts to bring a corral, all these little, you know, wild creatures into a, into a more manageable space. So you're cutting things down, you're moving them around, rearranging them a little bit, because maybe the way you planned it is not necessarily looking good once you start to actually play it out on your timeline. That's very common. That's common for you to totally change your mind often and rearrange things or even take things out that you thought would maybe work good and maybe they don't. Maybe they make the project drag on too long. Um, so your rough cut happens. Next thing you're gonna be working towards is a fine cut. Uh, the fine cut is polishing it. Um, this is where you make adjustments to the, the color, the brightness, the luminance, the sound levels. This is where you try to, you know, play with transitions. You try to get it all together so that it, it actually boils down into a nice, you know, flowing piece that is going to totally impress the world. So hopefully, anyway, somebody. All right, so now I want to expand on these points. Um, and all this stuff, again, is specific to, to the person who's doing this work. Um, this is what works for me sometimes. This doesn't even work for me every time. I don't do this on every project. Um, I handle different projects differently. But this is kind of like the classic approach. So the classic approach, you begin with a plan. Um, I think it's good to start by conceptualizing, so making an outline of your project. Some people will, will jot it down, scribble it out. Other people will type it up nice as a nice document. Um, you know, other people just have it in their head. But I have examples of plans. This is one uh, about my friend Bob, who unfortunately passed away two years ago. Um, so I started by putting, you know, my thoughts on paper. What do I want, what do I want to accomplish with this video? I did gather a fair amount of footage, um, but there were other things that I didn't that I still need to gather. So the top uh, paragraph there talks about the spirit of the project. It's a documentary of the spirit. It's a tribute. It's an exploration of the complexity of who he was. It's a reflection of his path, uh, how that intersected with my path, our path. Uh, some of you may even remember him. He was a Can TV producer. Um, and he was a Buddhist, and um, there were a lot of contradictions in his life. He dealt with a lot of uh, pain, and uh, this is a person who had problems with uh, drug abuse, um, incarceration, things like that. So, but he was very dear to me, and so I wanted to do this video about him. So how in the world do you do justice to an old friend who has passed away, you know, when you have all kinds of photos of, of him and her, him or her, and you've got video clips, you've got moments when he was collaborating with you at Can TV. You know, there's a lot of stuff there, an awful lot of stuff. So my first thought was, okay, these are my goals. These are my goals, that's my outline. My next step was to look at my material. There's page two there, by the way. It just kind of goes into more detail um, about different phases um, of my friend Bob's life. So uh, I've got something there about the structure. Um, you can read this you know, later in more detail when you have time to replay the video. But basically I'm just kind of outlining different aspects that are important to me to focus on um, to come up with a structure. And you know, a classic thing for editing is it does not have to follow life. It does not have to be in a linear structure. You don't have to follow the order that life, that it happened in real life. So looking at these different pieces, I'm thinking, okay, maybe, you know, I can do something where I start, you know, start with the present and work my way back to the past. You know, you have to start thinking three-dimensionally. So that's part of your workflow is just coming up with, you know, this, this, this overall concept, the structure, so that you can then move forward in a, an efficient way. So once, you know, I made an outline, next steps, uh, there are some other examples of outlines I think we might have to show here. Because um, there are, you know, just like so many people, I'm usually a multitasking and, um, you know, trying to work on more than one project at a time. Um, 
so yeah, there's another one I was doing about the Cuban five. These are five Cubans who are uh, doing um, uh, surveillance of uh, Cubans in Miami. And so that was a whole big complex project as well. So we got another plan there. Who are the Cuban five? And so I start there by just kind of listing my footage, the footage that I uh, gathered at different um, conferences that dealt with the subject, uh, protests, rallies, interviews, things of that nature. Just like making, making sense of what do I have to work with, you know, and then maybe I can come up with a plan on how to edit that, um, and so on and so forth. So, you know, these are your preliminary things. Then you can work towards the next step, which is logging your footage. Um, logging your footage means uh, notating it, putting it down on paper one way or another. And what I recommend is using a log sheet. You can either create one yourself. You can like take a, a spreadsheet program like Excel and you can create something like this that you're seeing. Um, and as you can see there, it's uh, got four columns. The first one is putting down what, what SD card did the footage come from? Because maybe you've shot on three or four cards. So you can, you know, a good workflow is to number your cards, put little stickers on them, some little label on them, so you know where the footage came from. Or if it's a tape, what's the roll number? And then clip length is how long that particular clip is. Uh, that really does help you with your editing process, your planning, because then you can see, oh, okay, this is just 10 seconds long, I'm just gonna flash that for a moment versus, oh no, that clip goes on for five minutes and there's something probably really important there that I need to look at. Um, and then the next column over is description. So description, obviously you describe what the shot is and there's a whole art to that. Um, well, not, not an art to describing, but there's certain points to, to remember here. So you wanna abbreviate when possible. I'll show you the next slide up. Uh, we'll be looking at an actual, here we go, log sheet. And um, so in the description column, you're seeing things like uh, W, S, uh, means wide shot. Uh, you're looking at CU close up, um, you know, things like that. So it, it describes the frame. And uh, then there's, you know, the action that's happening there, POV, point of view. Um, yeah, you can see that there. And this, this particular one is the project that I'm gonna mostly talk about today. And um, it talks about this whole past six, more or more than six months actually, this past year of our experience during this pandemic time, this is why I'm wearing this, um, you know, underneath the COVID-19 era. And so um, again, I was gathering footage uh, whenever I could. I was just, I carry around this little camera here um, and so it's convenient because, you know, you never know when you're going to come across something interesting uh, related to this. So I did gather a lot of photos, a lot of video clips of things going on. So the log sheet you saw there was, you know, putting down what those were. And th this was um, after I transferred it, then I logged it. So. So the transfer happens, um, like I said, you're gonna look at your clips first. You're gonna look at directly at the little SD card at what you have to work with from that camera and decide which of those are important to you and transfer them over to an external hard drive. So external hard drive as part of the hardware aspect of your workflow. So this is a nice little one terabyte drive. Um, it's a G drive, I recommend that. Um, but yeah, a hard drive such as that or a Seagate, you know, we have all these recommendations that we like to give here at Can TV. Um, I don't wanna unplug this, so I'm not gonna pull that up too high. But um, you want an external hard drive that can have, a, a, that has a spinning disc, a magnetic disc that goes at least 7,200 revolutions per minute. Um, that, that spinning speed is important because then it can properly read video and stream video. If it spins at lower speeds, it's the video is gonna glitch and freeze and stuff like that. Now, um, you could also get a solid state drive and solid state drives don't have that spinning disk, you know, situation. So that's another viable way to go. 
Um, so anyway, you're going to look at those clips on the SD card. You're going to transfer them over. And we're, I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail. And then when you transfer them over is when you can then um, identify them. And so first of all, where do we go? Where do we go to find those clips? So we need to start looking in the appropriate folders. Um, on those SD cards, there are certain folders that you're going to look at. So let's start by this one. This is a common first level uh, place to look for material. Um, the folder that has the photos is usually DCIM. Um, then you've got MP root and private. So the MP root folder for this particular camera that I was just showing you, this, which is a Sony, uh, small Sony camera, it stores its video clips in the MP root folder. The next folder is, um, there we go, 100 ANV01. It always says that. It's, you know, in this particular case, with the, if you're looking in an MP root folder, that's the next folder you'll see. You got to keep clicking, you got to keep opening, because these are folders inside of other folders. And so here's all the whole line of different folders here. And um, so you're eventually going to get to the point where you see your clips. So number five there, that column is your clips, and you can see that the camera gave them specific numbers. Number six is the date that the recording happened. Um, number seven there is the type of file it is, and the size is number eight. So the type of file, um, you might need to click that column heading to get it to see just those types of files, because sometimes it mixes it up with other kinds of files. So if you just click that header, it'll show you just those files. Um, so anyway, then you can start double clicking on the files and opening them up in a, um, you know, you know, in a player. It could be a Windows Media Player. It could be, um, it could be just any number of other players that are out there. A QuickTime player might play them. Um, so just watch them, and then you'll know. Okay, yeah, I get a, a general idea. I remember what this is about. Um, I'm going to use this material. Now there. Um, there are some complications which I would like to elaborate on, I will. Um, I'm just being general right now. I'm just saying generally that's where you find those particular files. Now there are other kind of files too. Uh, so if we look at the next slide, you're gonna see what you call AVCHD. The CAN TV cameras, that is the codec that it uses to encode its video. Um, it ends with the letter HD, so that's an easy way to remember it, and it's in a private folder. So you can see the, uh, in the bar above, in the little white bar above, you can see cam SD, that shows the SD card, and you see the folder private, and then the folder AVCHD. So as you can see, it's like a folder inside of another folder inside of another folder. It's like a, it's like a Russian doll, okay? One folder inside of another inside of another. Um, so the next layer down there is BDMV, after you open AVCHD. But let me talk about AVCHD for a second. Um, what is a codec? These are good terms to understand. Um, you know, as you edit, you, you know, it's a process of self-education. So a codec stands for a compression decompression um, compression decompression algorithm, something of that nature. So it takes, it's the way that the camera encodes your video, it basically to compress it into a size that's manageable so that the SD card doesn't totally fill up in just five minutes, you know? So it tries to compress data down and then it decompresses it later. So the, there's a, the codec works in reverse when you're actually using it to edit. So that's what the AVCHD is, it's a codec. It's the type of system the camera uses. So, okay, so let's say, all right, we, we went in, we saw those files. Um, at that point, you can drag the clips themselves to a location on your external hard drive. Like I said, that's what you're trying to do here, your overall plan. Not editing the SD card, but editing the copies that you're gonna make. So you copy over those raw clips to your external hard drive. Um, then you can rename them to names that make sense. And this is, takes us to naming conventions and workflows. Um, now, and this is, this is an example of the camera I was just discussing, the Sony XH, X, HX80. 
Um, so the DCIM contents, those are the photos. I would put those into a photo folder that you create on your external drive. Um, but then you're going to go look for the video clips. And um, the video clips, well, I, well, before I go look into video clips, I recommend that you delete the contents of the DCIM folder so that, you know, you'll, you'll know in a mo moment why I'm saying that. You don't want to create redundancies when you're transferring your video. What that amounts to is we recommend that you don't just copy naked raw clips over to a folder on an external drive. You can, and it will probably work, and actually it does work most of the time. There's not a problem. But there are instances where that can cause, um, for example, sound to go out of sync. Uh, you can, it causes metadata loss. You won't have necessarily metadata associated with the clip. You know, what is metadata? You know, things like the date it was recorded and maybe all the camera settings, you know, there's all kinds of metadata that's in there. So you won't get the metadata and you might have sound sync issues. So now, nine, now you know, nine times out of 10, these things don't happen. You don't have a sound problem. You don't have a sync problem. And if you do, you can fix it. So, you know, one workflow, this is your choice, is if you wanna save time, just go ahead grab the, spe the specific individual clips that you want, transfer them over to a folder on your external drive and work with those, there you go, you should be fine. But you know, here and there we encounter those issues that I was mentioning. So if you wanna play it by the book and do it right, then what you have to do is something a little, a little more grand. You have to take not just the individual clips, you gotta take the whole folder structure. Um, private, AV, CHD, BDMV, stream. So basically what you would be doing is right clicking on just the SD card and copying it and pasting it into a destination on your external drive. And that will take all of those folders along with it when you copy paste the entire SD card. Now this particular type of workflow is will preserve all of the metadata, the time code, the audio should remain in sync if you do it that way. But obviously there's a disadvantage to that. You're copying everything, including what you might not want to use. There may be 200 clips on that SD card. Maybe this project only needs you to use whatever, 20 or 30 of those 200 clips. So you're gonna use up space on your hard drive make copying all that stuff over. It takes time to copy over a lot of video uh, clips. Also depends on your computer. Maybe your computer is not all that fast. Um, there's a lot of factors to consider here. So, you, so when you, you know, back to, back to the um, overall general workflow here um, is hardware setup. You know, like I said, you have to have a, a powerful computer some people come in here with a little flimsy little laptop that's like six years old and thinking they can edit a video on it. And uh, you know, we, we kind of, you know, we keep our thoughts to ourselves, but we basically are looking at it like, um, yeah, we, you know, we try to give somebody some, some hard advice, which is I'm afraid you might have to go buy a new computer. Um, so yeah, you gotta have a powerful computer, um, dual processors, Quad core, eight core is even better. But it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be ideal just because it has more you know, pistons in the engine. So a powerful, let's just say, a powerful computer. You need decent external hard drives um, and probably more than just one if you're gonna do this for a long time. Um, you, know, but, you know, at home I've got stack. You know? So it starts to get a little crazy. So you wanna have drives that are reliable and I've also learned the hard way that you really need to back up your data. You need to have a, um, like a time machine backup or some kind of backup where your work can be preserved. Some people, a lot of people are editing now on the cloud. So if you have the, say the Adobe account, the Adobe suite, you can back up to the cloud if you have that particular type of account and that will safeguard your, your, your assets. So, so the workflow really is individual. It's like, okay, can you afford to be, have an Adobe account? Okay, maybe not. 
Uh, maybe you prefer just your own, you know, maybe you're, you're a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. You don't want to put it, up. that's me, actually. I don't want to, I haven't, I've resisted putting my material out on the cloud for years. Uh, that's why I have all these, that's why I have all these hard drives. Um, so anyway, yeah, um, to have a decent archival system in place. We can talk more in detail on that, but first I want to take a little uh, break here. I want to ask, uh, I want to answer a question. Okay, the question is, when, do, when to replace an aging SD card or hard drive? When should you start to phase it out? Yeah, that's a really uh, crucial question. Um, well, from my understanding, SD cards can be reused many, many times. If you look at the literature from the company, they'll, they'll say how the exact, well, not exact number, but you know, they'll give you a number. And it's probably way more than you can ever, ever do. But in reality, though, the word is that, you know, they start to become less effective. The more times that you erase them and reformat them, they apparently become less effective. Now, I myself have not, I haven't experienced that because I don't reuse mine that often. I might reuse them so two or three or four times at the most. Um, I think if you talk to someone who was more like a news gathering person, like working for NBC or something, they go out every day and record and then they have to dump off the footage and format and, and you know come up with a blank card again. Uh, they would have a better idea of that. They could answer that question. Um, hard drives, though, yes, I do have experience with hard drives. External hard drives have a shelf life. They do die. Um, I've been through it. I've been through the pain of that. Uh, you can see that you know, when they're dying, sometimes they often will warn you. you. They start to act a little strange. They start to make noises. If they're making noises, you know, oh, the end is near. This is like final stage here. So. Um, so I think a good rule of thumb would be like, um, I've had some that are going strong now for like five years, but I wouldn't count on them giving me a whole other five years. So I think um, what you, you just have to have a backup system for the stuff that's really important. You wanna maybe copy it to more than one place. Um, so yeah, you know, at some point it might actually start to become um, unworkable. It won't, you won't be able to get it to mount, you know, on your system. You won't be able to see it come up and acts, be able to access it until you really fuss with it a lot. Like plug it in, unplug it, plug it, stuff like that. Um, there's people who go to extremes, like when the hard drive fails, they'll put it in the freezer, for example. They'll put it in a bag and freeze it and, then take it out a day later and let it thaw out. And sometimes they say that that gets the parts to work. You know, it, it constrains and then expands the parts and then they loosen up. But that's if you have a mechanical problem with the rotating disc. I don't know. I, it didn't work for me. I tried it with my a drive that failed. Um, there are, you know, all kinds of home remedies. Some people will bake their electronics. Um, you know, they'll put it in the oven at a certain temperature for 20 minutes or something, and that's where the soldering points soften and melt, and because sometimes the solder gets brittle and old, and it kind of like falls to the hole or whatever, and if you bake it, it can soften it, and it can reseat, and sometimes it actually fixes the problem, but even that's a temporary fix. Anyway, these are extreme things. I've, you know, I've, I'm, I've probably opened a can of worms I shouldn't have opened here, but um, yeah, let's take another question. What's the question? Um, all right, the question is about how long can you leave material, how long can you leave footage on an SD card before you transfer it? And um, again, my, my experience is uh, a long, long time. It seems to be very stable. As long as you keep it in this, you know, a cool, dry place, uh, as long as you're not touching it, you don't want to touch it because the oils on your fingers, if they get on the contacts, that corrodes them. Or, or if you touch it, you could spark it. You know, you get a static spark, it could damage your data. Um, so as long as you're not touching it, as long as it's in a cool, dry place, away from magnetic sources and electrical fields, um, it should be pretty stable for a long, long time. I have cards 10 years old that I'm still, you know, pulling footage off of. 
Um, so it's very stable. I, in, th in fact, that's one of the reasons I don't reuse them that much is because I, I, I consider them to be an archival uh, format, you know, a good place to store my originals. And it's small, obviously, so that's nice. Um, and if you label them and put them on a shelf, it's great. It, sh it should stay for a long, long time. So getting back to my agenda, um, I was uh, talking about file uh, naming conventions and workflows. So when you rename your files, um, it is a little bit of an art form. So what I do is I will first, I'll prepare a folder, that's item number three there, for the video files on my external hard drive. And this is how I will name the folder. I will name it video underscore. Now I'll put what month that video was created and then underscore two underscore and the last video that I, that I have on that SD card that month and then underscore year. So there's a folder that you know, has that name on it so you can tell it's got video in it. It's from whatever, let's just say from September to November 2019, so yeah. Uh, but that's my system. Um, you can have your own system that makes sense to you. And so then I would take the entire contents of the file structure from the SD card, drag it into that folder that I made. And so that those all those that DCIM and you know stream and so on and so forth, uh, BDMV, all those folders will be in that folder, and I can find them. So naming that folder wisely by whatever makes sense to you will make it easier to find later on down the road. Um, and then, you know, if you don't have time to rename every single clip, because this is also where you can then go down to the lowest level, go into the basement there where you see all the clips with their unique camera numbers that the camera name them. You can go there and begin to rename those clips. Um, now, you may have a zillion clips there. It could take you quite a long time to rename them. So an, another workflow could be, instead of renaming each and every clip, look at a particular category of clips, a certain type of material. Maybe it's stuff you shot in the woods. And so it could be, you could name the first one, or here's my examples, okay. Um, footage shot in the daytime, footage shot at night. Short material, lengthy material, city, forest. Toddlers, teens, you know, it depends on your project. Uh, working people, retired people, um, you know, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, that will help you um, figure out a good place to put all this material. Then there could be subcategories uh, or other folders for other assets. So graphics that you create could go into a graphics folder, audio and audio, photos and photos. Those are broad categories, so, you know, Looking later, two years from now, or as some of you seem to be planning, 10 years from now, <laughs> breaking out the material. Um, if you look at a folder that just says photos, you're not gonna know what's in there. So you're gonna wanna probably create some subcategories. So as you can see, you can make another folder inside of your photos folder that has these other things. Um, opening, you know, these could be for graphics, for example. Opening graphics, closing gra graphics, lower thirds, Maybe another folder for music, another for sound effects. Maybe there's something for contemporary material and others historic. Maybe these are photos. So you have some historical photos versus some modern. Maybe you're doing a video about architecture. You know, that'd be a good idea to categorize. So you have to think of categorizing your material, uh, putting it into folders that make sense. Now, after you do that, that's great. You will have, you'll be able to go to your external hard drive. You're gonna be able to see these folders that have these particular kind of things in them. And then you're gonna, you will be able to find that footage. But again, I was mentioning a case where you may have more than one hard drive. You may have doo -doo 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 stack of hard drives. That's when it gets, you know, a little unmanageable. So what I have done, I've created a system for myself, which I recommend which is an archival, a sheet that has a, sort of a list of what each hard drive has. And at home, I have my hard drives labeled. So I have one labeled mini. It's actually this mini drive I was holding up a little while ago is my mini hard drive that's, that's labeled like that. Um, this is my mini drive, because yeah, it's so mini. And then the other drives are more full-sized. And so there's an A drive, a B drive, a C, a D, an E, and an F. I think that's, no, I have a few others too. 
But yeah, I, I'm listing what's on those drives, and um, I've made made the major folders are on the left, and then more subfolders are in the middle there. Um, so you might want to just take a moment to examine that, <clears throat> and you can see how that's broken down, and also what kind of uh, files they might be, um, the types of projects they are, um, you know. It, it makes sense to me. I'm not expecting it to make sense to you, but this, is, this, this, these, all these, every word on this page makes sense to me. And when you, if you do this, obviously you can make it so it makes sense to you. So I call that my hard drive archive, and that's just a, a file on my computer. Um, just, it's just on my desktop, and it's just an icon sitting there. Anytime I need to remind myself, oh, where is that footage? Uh, my friend Bob, you know, for example, I double click that little icon, boom, the spreadsheet opens up, and I do a search. I do a control F to find it, and I type in Bob, and boom, 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 here it is. Oh, it's on hard drive C, and it's in this folder. And, now this is upfront work, this is work. This takes time, this takes time to notate these things. So these are like developing good habits where um, instead of waiting years to put down what you have, after you transfer it into a folder on an external drive, that's when you can take another minute or two to open up your spreadsheet and write it down. Just type in, okay, uh, it's on drive C and this is the folder I put it in, boom. And you feel good about it too. You feel like, okay, it has an address. It's just, I didn't just, you know, send it into, you know, oblivion. Um, it lives somewhere and I can find it again. So yeah, all that stuff is, is detailed work. It's upfront work um, designed to make the actual editing process go smoothly, which is good workflow. So now I think what I wanna do is try to go you know, into it in real time. I wanna try to demonstrate a little bit of this in action. And um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, sh using my edit decision list that I have created, um, I'm gonna follow my own list and I'm gonna try to create this project. And I only have about 10 minutes or so, I believe, before uh, I'm gonna open it up to questions, like live questions. But there's my EDL, edit decision list. And by the way, this is a handwritten EDL. You could type it out if you wanted to. And um, a lot of the higher end editing programs, the more professional programs, you can export um, an EDL or you can export an XML. These are basically, well, those are different things. Um, the XML is more like a, um, it's a snapshot of your project. It's all of the, the stuff on your timeline, all the instructions you gave the computer, what to do with the footage. That's exportable. You can actually export that in case somebody else wants to work on the project and they have a system that they can work on. This is one of the ways that people work as, as teams. And this is a whole other level of workflow is, um, you know, like people that work on a feature film, for example, there's usually a team of editors so um, they need to share data, they need to share materials, they also need to all be seeing the timeline, they all need to see a common timeline. So, you know, one way, the, the classic way has been to share the, the edit decision list and also to export the XML um, so that they can reconstruct what you're working on. Everybody would also have access to the same footage on the cloud and so that that, that blueprint of the program can then reference those clips and everybody is on the same page. So that's not where we're at because we're, we're, we're here at CAN TV. This is community access where most of us are uh, individuals working as uh, small, you know, small one man, one woman crews. So we're not gonna go there. We're not gonna talk too much about that team effort thing. Um, so I'm gonna use my EDL now since I'm just working here by myself and I'm gonna to try to make a project. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. And let's see, I've opened up Elements, there it is. And so, you know, I, I have done all the hard work of transferring the clips to an external drive. I have then put them into folders and renamed them. And so I need to bring them in. So I'm gonna to go to Add Media 
And since they are already files existing on my external drive, I will click on Files and Folders. And so now I need to find them, and I know where I put them, because I've been working on this for a while. And so I, on my external drive here, I created an Edit Workflow folder for this workshop. And I created a, another folder called COVID Times clips and COVID times photos. Those are my two main, uh, my two main folders for this project. So I'm going to open up the clips folder. And there's that folder I mentioned before, MP root. So I'm going to open that up. I'm going to open up the A100 ANV. And there we go. There's my clips populating. OK, so there's a lot of stuff here. And so I could select individual clips and bring them in, uh, just holding down control and clicking. I could do that. Um, there's, yeah, I, don't, I didn't count these. I don't even remember how many there are. There's a lot, a lot of clips here. So maybe I should look at this a different way. Um, I should look, instead of looking at these thumbnails, I can come over to the right here and click and display it differently. I can display details, for example. So now I have a list. And so on my log sheet, I made um, note of the dates that these different pieces of footage were gathered. And let me go to the top and go down to 625. All right, there it is. And shift click that. I can always come back and get more if I need more. For now, this is what I'm going to bring in. Um, all right, so I'm going to hit open. And that should add the material to my assets panel. So I'm waiting for that to happen. And while I wait, let me just mention that, yes, I did start to make an edit decision list on this. So I'm going to go to my edit decision list so I can anticipate what I'm going to be doing next. So according to my edit decision list, I also have some stills. I have some photos that I need to gather. All right, so my, my videos came in. Uh, now I'm going to add media, files and folders. And up here at the top, see, I can click back to go to any uh, intermediate folder that I want to. So I'm going to come back to before the COVID times clips. I'm going to go to edit workflow and go look at the other folder I mentioned, COVID times photos. And there we go. I've got categories here. And I can um, open these up and select what I need. And I'm going to go ahead and bring in all these photos. So I'm going to go Control A and hit Open. And that's one category of photos. And so before I go too much farther, it might be a good idea to start getting this material organized because you can see that it's a lot of stuff and it's getting a little crazy. So those who edit with elements know that you can make folders and put stuff in those folders. So I'm going to do that. Um, all these folders I just brought in, um, I'm going to put them in a photos folder. So new, I, oh, there's a new folder, new folder. And I think the broad category here is photos. So let me just start with that. So photos, I like to misspell photos with the letter F. And then all those that I just dragged in, those JPEGs, those can be put in there. So they haven't even all shown up yet. Yeah, they're still bringing them in from the computer, still bringing them in. So let me hold shift and click. That'll select all of those and then drag into the photos folder. The other stuff is videos. So I'm going to right click and go new folder and make a videos folder. Let me make them all caps the way I did the other one. All right. One, one shortcut I like to take, because you know, having shortcuts is, good, is, a, is a good idea. To Every shortcut you can take will save you time, because this stuff takes forever. So instead of going and control click one after another, after another, after another, instead of doing that, what I like to do sometimes is just take all of them, go control A, and then unselect the ones I don't want. So I'm going to unselect the folders, control click on each of these folders. 
because I don't need the video, uh, the photos going into the videos folder. It's quicker sometimes to select everything and then just unselect a few things than it is to go and select a big thing. So, okay, I'm gonna drag those into the videos folder. So there we go, nice and organized. And then, you know, you can do subfolders by double clicking and opening and all of this stuff can be recategorized. I can, I can make another folder here. And for example, I've got um, protests. That could be a folder. So I'll make a protest folder. And just get my typing down here. Okay, protests. Um, another folder is um, similar to the category I saw a minute ago. Um, I call it uh, life adjusted. So life adjusted. That's like all the changes we've all had to go through because of COVID. Um, there's another one called nature. Nature to deal with the stress. We go out into nature. So I've got all these folders now. And so I can start to drag those different materials into those folders. All right, so the protest stuff tends to all be together. So let me grab that cluster, drag that into protests. There we go, okay. So, and then there's um, the life adjustments. So that's a lot of stuff. Um, so, you know, this will take me a few minutes to actually go through all this. And luckily I've named these. I've given these good names that make this so much easier. If I didn't name these and these were just numbers, you know, that could make it harder. I think I'll just get the protests done and then we'll do everything else. Protest, protest, protest. So yeah, I don't know if any of you guys participated in any protests this year, but there were a lot of things to protest about, so hopefully you did. Hopefully you got off your couch, stopped watching Netflix, got out there, raised your voice here and there. All right, that's all protest footage. So let me throw that into protests. And you know, subcategories of that would be um, the particular protests. So there was Black Lives Matter protests. Um, there are protests against police brutality, against incarceration, more specifically. Um, protests against Trump, protests, you know, of every nature. So we're getting close to the end here. So really quickly, I'm going to now start to put this stuff on a timeline. And according to my edit decision list, I wanted to start with um, a photo and so I'm going to just go ahead and start trying to build something on my timeline um, where I'm out in nature and I'm planning on putting a voiceover on top of it. So that's the part where I'm dealing, we're dealing with life and we're dealing with the changes of, of life. And so I'm going to put in uh, some of the material from things we dealt with on the street. So. I'm going back to my project asset uh, uh, panel here, and I'm gonna go up a level. That's what this little folder does. I'm gonna go over to my life adjusted folder. And according to my decision list, um, we've got these moments when we were dealing with the National Guard. And you, some of you guys remember how the National Guard came in and were cordoning off the downtown area and all that. So I'm gonna take these, and I might as well just drag them straight down to the timeline, plunk them down on the timeline. And so I'm not even gonna look at those right now. Um, I'm just following my edit plan. I'm just gonna plunk them down on the timeline and move on to the next thing. The next thing on my list is a wide shot of waiting in line in front of Mariano's. And there it is. So let's throw that on the timeline. And then after that, we've got some still images and so I've got to find my stills folder. Now, these are all video, so let me go to photos. There we go. That's probably where that, those photos were that I was looking for a minute ago. I'm gonna go to some of the murals. So I'm gonna start clicking on some of these murals. And right now, again, I'm not gonna to worry too terribly much about the order of these. And I'm gonna throw those down on the timeline. And so since there's no audio there, part of my plan has to take that into account. And I was planning on putting a voiceover under this. 
So briefly, let's take a look at what we got here so far. We've got the National Guard blocking an intersection. And it's rough footage, as you can see, so it needs some editing. I need to cut some stuff out. Um, let me look at it a little bit bigger. So yes, they were blocking the intersection, so on and so forth. So let me jump ahead, and here's a part where I, comp not complain, but you know, I talk about it. We were trying to go to Mariano's to do some shopping, and we couldn't even get there. We tried three different ways to get there, couldn't get there. So that was our personal little discomfort, and there's the line at Mariano's when we finally made it there. And then we talk about Pilsen and the different murals in Pilsen, the Black Lives Matters, you know, uh, stand that people took. A lot of great, good stuff. There's a lot more material there, and so I'm planning on putting a voiceover down below and um, maybe even some music. So you get, maybe you're beginning to get the idea here. And so we're wrapping this up at this point. If, if there's any more questions, uh, I can try to answer them real quick. But in the meantime, you know, please uh, try to check back with us because we're going to try to make this a little more elaborate and we'll make it available online as a video that you can watch again. OK, well, here's a question coming in. Uh, someone's asking about how long does it take you to do a workflow for a five-minute video from start to finish. Um, that's, it depends on the project. Um, it might not be the answer the caller wants to hear, but it really depends on the project. How many assets are there in that project? How many video clips? How many photos, et cetera? How good is it you know, recorded? Because if the, if the image looks fine and the sound is good, that's a lot less work you have to do in editing. Um, your workflow, your planning stage, would have to take that into account. You know, do you have to, again, assess your, your material, look at it, watch it, take notes on it, make a log sheet. And if you notice, oh, I've got this recurring audio problem. I'm going to have to fix this in all my clips. Well, then you're going to have to uh, put in filters and things. And part of your workflow would then, a, a good workflow would then be to not just work one clip at a time, but more like, fix one clip, put a filter on it, and then copy that filter to each of the other clips that need that filter applied to them. And that's also for color correction and things like that. You know, you can make that happen. Um, so yeah, I hopefully, I mean, if, if you get, the thing is it takes time to get to the point where all of these things become more second nature. These are habits. These are habits you need to form. So it doesn't, it's not, you know, we're not robots. So it depends on each of us on how, how much energy we put into this, uh, how long term do we do it, how dedicated are we to it, how frequent can we sit down and work on this project. We all kind of suffer from that. I mean, I, the reason my projects take so long, mine take a long time, by the way, is because two things. I'm a perfectionist, and I didn't have all these good habits, and uh, I'm, I'm having to relearn some of my, I have to get rid of some of my bad habits. I got some bad advice years ago that has now caused me trouble, and I've been having to spend a long time, like, like I mentioned, making the lists of what I have and things like that. So really, there's no easy answer to this question. Um, let's just say it, it has so many different factors to it that it depends on you, the person. But if you really bear down on it and focus, and you have nothing else to do <laughs> if, you are, if you're at home for months on end, um, yeah, and maybe maybe a five minute video could be could be done. Uh, let's just say an average five minute video. Maybe you've got a couple of dozen clips. I don't know, twenty or thirty clips, maybe. So you know, you can bang that out in a week or two, maybe. But in general, it's going to take you a lot longer. So everybody, we're running out of time. We're coming to the end of our workshop. I I'm sorry I couldn't get deeper into my 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 rough cut and couldn't show you a fine cut or anything like that. I'm, I'm going to keep working on this project. So thanks, everybody. <laughs>